Hello chess friends, this is Fidel Master Valero Limov and in our lecture today I'm going to present you one of the most incredible chess masterpieces in history. The immortal Tuktwang game. You know, the Tuktwang, which, which is in Germany uh, translated uh, relatively to compulsion to move, is one of the most basic principles of, simple, uh, of the simple chess endgames, in which in order to win, one side must force the other to move away from a key square in order to promote a pawn or either to take uh, uh, um, some unpleasant square with, with a, an important piece. So, most frequently, it is about the square, and eventually, when one of the sides, uh, uh, one of the side leaves that square, uh, the uh, the opponent is taking it and eventually gets an advantage. It is most common to fight two flank positions in positions with extremely reduced material, such as king and pawn end games, in which if a player were not required to make a move, nothing would be wrong. So, however, once in a long, well, a game is played, a Tuxfang position is reached with a larger number of pieces remaining. This is very rare because the number of possible moves in a chess game rises sharply with each additional piece on the board. The most famous example of this kind of position is known as the Immortal Tuxfang game and was played by Aaron Nimsovich against Friedrich Zemisch in Hop Copenhagen in 1923. Both players were extremely strong grandmasters at the time, but Nimzovich was one of the world having recently systematized uh, chess theory to an unheard of degree, and his groundbreaking book, uh, maybe everyone is knowing that, The My System. So his style was based on the prophylaxis, and he always recommended nullifying the opponent's plans before in breaking on one's own. In the following game, he reduces Zemish to immobility in only 25 moves and eventually creates a, a very beautiful uh, chess masterpiece. So, let's have a look at that game. d4, knight f6, c4, pawn e6. So, now, if white continues with the move knight c3, Black is just going to play bishop b4, and we have the initial position of the Nimzo Indian defense. This uh, opening was named after our Nimzovich, so well, together with the Nimzovich opening, it happens after first e4 and knight c6. This was the second opening system named uh, uh, after this great uh, chess gra uh, master, our Nimzovich. So he prepared the system. The Nimzo Indian is the idea of Black now is to. Uh, take on c3 in the appropriate time to make double pawns of white and with this after a move like c5 to block them and eventually exploit. A very solid positional idea that a lot of uh, players from every level are using even in our time. However, there is a chance for white to avoid that and this happens with the move knight f3. So with this move now the bishop b4 will be ineffective since white is not going to put an knight there. Not really, uh, he will not really give uh, black an opportunity to make double pawns after bishop b4. White is just going to put a, the, his bishop on d2. And uh, this is also a nice variation. Black can now drop his bishop back and white's piece on d2 is not very well placed. However, it, will, it is uh, now popular bishop b4, but in, in that time... Uh, this line with bishop b4 was considered to be not such a good one. And the most popular variation these days were actually b pawn to b6 and uh, uh, the, the move pawn to c5. In this particular game, Nimzovich played the move b6, just uh, getting an idea to bring his bishop on b7. And this continuation makes more sense, because now... Practically, when black develops his bishop out to b7, he takes under a control the e4 square, and eventually the strategical point behind white's or black's plan will be to um, predominate in the center. So, once black gets the control of these squares on e4, d5, and maybe with a move like d6, and the e5 square, he will uh, pressurize white's play, and this was actually the main idea of Nimzovich in that game. Let's... Continue forward and see what happened. White played g3, bishop to b7, bishop to g2, and now the move bishop to e7. Now black is getting his dark square bishop out on uh, a normal position, 
it doesn't seem to be very promising, this kind of development. Black seems not to fight uh, with, with some kind of uh, um, effectively looking moves in uh, with the pawns in the center. But however, he has a particular idea to keep a uh, more stable and uh, pawn structure and flexible development. So white played knight c3, castles, white castles. This is a very common position in, in the theory. And now uh, Nimsovich made a move that uh, is not so, so bad at all. However, it's a dubious move, the move d5. This is a dubious move because now what is getting a chance to begin a concrete a counter, uh, play, I can say, in the center and make a weakness in, in black's position. So, uh, practically after the move d5, white is getting a chance to play c takes d5. And now if black takes with the e pawn there, he will open the e file, but uh, now the d5 pawn will be fixed. So once this pawn is fixed, white can proceed with a move like uh, a mighty e5. And so this is a typical position in which the bishop on g2 is uh, blocked as the bishop on b7 by the pawn on d5. But the, if we just try to, see, uh, to calculate which bishop is better, we will estimate that the g2 bishop is much uh, effective uh, because uh, the d5 pawn is uh, being uh, hit by this bishop right now. So with the move knight e5... Um, Black can go with some move like knight b to d7 in order to exchange it and make some weaknesses. However, it's not so easy. White can proceed with queen a4. This is a very nice positional trick that uh, can happen. And now there is a plan of knight to c6. So eventually black will have to um, play something like knight c 5 in order to avoid that knight c6. And then after d c 5 the pawn on d5 is hanging. So uh, this is really unpleasant. Uh, when, when a position like this arises, there will be a rook to d1 coming, the d5 pawn will be attacked even with semi flag e4, and uh, white is getting superior chances. So in order to avoid it, what I, uh, uh, and the, the chess theory actually recommends, is uh, in case of, of this move, uh, c takes d5, even when black plays d5, to uh, avoid the taking with the pawn and eventually to recapture on that square with the knight. So by taking with peace, black is um, getting no pawn weaknesses. Eventually the bishop on b7 remains active. And now knight takes d5 doesn't really give uh, white anything good. In case of knight takes d5, maybe black can recapture with the bishop. So now, uh, if white takes the knight back, the light squared bishops, uh, will, bishop will be exchanged. Some idea like c5 will occur. And black is doing okay. And if white plays something like queen c2, maybe black can go with some moves like, uh, say, um, in this position, safe c5 could be played, or maybe even something like um, knight a6 could, be, uh, could happen. Black is having a good position as a whole. Maybe still white can get an upper hand with this kind of exchange because it is eliminating a central pawn for, from black for, for a bishop's pawn. However, it's not such a, such a bad continuation. It's just uh, considered to be slightly worse than the other move that uh, currently uh, is estimated as the best plan. I just want to show you this because it's very much connected with the, with the game and uh, actually as, as it's involved. So the move this knight e4 is the modern approach to play the, the so-called Queen's Indian defense that uh, was played in this game. And now the plan is, after a move like Queen c2, to exchange the knights and basically to open a free way for the f7 uh, pawn. So now with the move like f5, black is taking a very solid control of the e4 square, and then black's plan will be to play b6, bishop f6, knight b to d7, and eventually after a move like queen e7, uh, he's getting very so, uh, flexible pawn structure, no weaknesses, and if white just removes f3 knight, then after, after the exchange of the light square bishop, uh, there will be some weaknesses in front of white's king. So, uh, for this reason, basically this knight e4 is considered to be better. However, Nimzovich played d5, and now white made the move knight e5. This is also an interesting idea. White is not hurrying to take on d5. Now the, the pawn is still there. However, it gives black a little chance that Nimzovich used really uh, 
really well. So this is the move C6. The main idea of the C6 move is practically to support the E5 pawn with the bishop's one. And now if white plays something like E4, which was actually the best continuation, black has also an idea to prepare D takes C4, Knight takes C4, and now B5. The plan will be eventually if white goes with something like uh, Knight to E3, maybe to continue with something like Queen B6 and uh, then Rook to D8. So the c6 pawn supported b5, and eventually uh, black can organize some kind of pressure against uh, the d4 pawn. And uh, if white goes with knight e5, again, black seems to have a com comfortable position after knight b to d7. No problems at all. After the exchange, black can play something like rook d8, c5, and the equal game is promised. So in, in order to, uh, to have this, black played the c6 move, a very interesting continuation, an opening idea, I can say, by Nimzovich. And the other plan of the c6 move, the other side, was that if white takes on d5, now black is getting an opportunity to recapture with the, the, with the bishop's pawn. So c takes d5. Now the, the, the plan that black has is to oh, keep the e6 pawn where it is and to, on the, uh, the, the, to keep the c file open. So Practically, this will bring back some new counterplay chances. And uh, let's see how that game involved. Why just played bishop to f4, bringing his bishop on a useful square, supporting the, uh, the strong outpost that white currently has. e5 knight. So black plays a6. The idea, as we can see, is very uh, easy to see. Black is playing uh, b5 next move, and eventually this will give him some more space on the queen side. And if white tries to prevent it with some move like a4, uh, it's obvious that after knight c6 there will cure some kind of weak squares on the queen side. The b4 square will be a weak, so black can put a piece there, or maybe a5 one. So it's a nice way for black to uh, come with. And uh, now white continues to rook c1, just to one thing to keep the pawn on a2 for an eventual possibility of a3 if black plays knight to c6. So black just took more space with b5. Queen b3. And now Nimzovich made a kind of a slight mistake. Well, the idea that he wanted to chase was actually right, but the promotion with knight to c6 was a qu uh, quite not good. Uh, the game is particularly right, but I just want to show the... the uh, Precise moments where White had the, an opportunity to uh, turn the game in his favor, or maybe to to get this, uh, or at least to get some slightly better chances. So knight c6 is a slight mistake that Nimzovic made. Uh, his particular idea is to exchange White's outpost on i on e5, that is pressurizing his position. This is a very good thing, but uh, the problem is that now after knight c6, after knight c6, bishop takes c6, White is having a very strong move. A particularly a strong idea with uh, um, the move knight e4. So basically, after after a black takes on that square, white can take on c6. He will open all of his play, and then eventually he will get uh, very active rooks on the open open files. So this is this was a very nice option. Maybe uh, Nimzovich was considering that the pawn that he will take will be uh, um, much much stronger than white's initiative. I don't really think so. I think that the chances will be equal after after White puts so uh, um, such kind of pressure, considering also that maybe the e4 pawn will not really gonna hold for for some so much time, and White is getting at least chances to equalize the game. So uh, maybe not to go with slightly better chances, but at least to uh, make some equality. However, in order to avoid such kind of possibility, it was easier to play knight b to d7. Chasing the same idea, and eventually now if white exchanges, black will uh, even bring a new piece. He will develop the queen out. So he played knight c6. However, white exchanged, and he didn't see uh, knight e4, and he began this wrong strategy just to make some useful moves, because he was unable to uh, uh, make any kind of uh, successful plan. And now I want to uh, tell just uh, as, an, as a rule, when there is a kind of position like this, and uh, a, one of the players 
don't really know doesn't really know what to do because there is no nothing particular to play on. There are no weaknesses of the opponent or something like that. Um, mo most of the players that are not so experienced, uh, I cannot really say that Dimzovic's player were, was not an experienced one. He was a grandmaster, but it, it happens sometimes even with grandmasters. So it happens uh, very frequently with O uh, of the, of the chess players. Uh, when there is nothing particular to play on, they are uh, finding um, um, a nor nor normal thing to play such kind of uh, moves like H3 or something like that. That d doesn't really make big sense uh, and are not so, so, so helpful. In order to avoid it, what I recommend to do as a principle is when you don't know what to do, a strat strategical method you can use to uh, Think about some kind of play on that particular area of the board where we can concentrate more pieces on. So eventually white has more pieces on the queen side. No matter that black has some more space there, eventually that pawn on b5 could be attacked with a move like a4. So white would have, uh, uh, have some uh, better perspectives to go with some uh, move like uh, even if we consider an ID4 uh, as, as a move that white didn't really uh, see. He overlooked that. Maybe a move like rook d1, e3, bishop f1 to improve the, the light square bishop or something like that just to begin some kind of play on the on the queen side. This would make more sense because the concentrated pieces there will guarantee white uh, a very good play. So after bishop takes c6 actually white continued with h3 and black simply developed. So he has a particular strategy and it happened clear after white played king queen king to h2 and knight h5. Now, black is attacking the bishop on f4, he wants to take it and break, break a white's kingside structure. So white is forced to take that bishop back, bishop to d2, and now here comes a very strong move by Nimzovic, the move f5. Basically, this move opens more space for black on the king side to attack and uh, also black is getting some perspective resources to continue with uh, bishop d6 to come up with f4 at some appropriate time and uh, um, eventually this is a very strong possibility. So white made one more passive move which I cannot really approve, queen to d1. Uh, being afraid by black's upcoming threats, uh, white decided to get his queen on the back rank, uh, maybe ha getting some ideas like e4 and so, but this is not so good and this is not very well because uh, now after the move b4, white is getting all of his pieces on, on uh, really passive squares. So maybe instead of queen d1, white had to continue with some move like, oh uh, let me get back, maybe something like a3 to pre uh, prevent b4, just to try to keep the pieces on a more advanced positions. Otherwise, simply by, by having uh, all of, of the other pieces on back squares, practically this is giving black an opportunity to uh, make some kind of attack. This is creating the circumstances that will give black a possibility to uh, um, get an advantage. So b4, knight b1, and bishop b5. Just stepping ahead with the, with the bishop on active position. And now white cannot really play e4 because the uh, rook is undermined. So white played rook to g1 and then uh, black played the simple bishop to d6. It's uh, very instructive to see how black is putting his all pieces on active squares and slightly is improving forward. Just going little by little to uh, improve and eventually get a very strong advantage. So uh, there is no way for white to improve a lot. For example, after a3, black would have played uh, some move like uh, pawn a5. Nothing can happen. Black can't, white cannot really release his position. And maybe it was the reason why he, he tried to go with uh, a move like e4. Well, what happens now? The knight on h5 is being threatened. It seems that if black takes it back, or maybe if he plays g6, uh, the a move like e5 is becoming possible. Black's all chances and plans will be uh, totally broken after a move like that, and there is nothing obvious. So how should black proceed in this position after a move like e4? Well, it's easy to see. When we have all the pieces placed already in, in better squares, only the, the rook on a8 and the queen ca can be introduced or on a more appropriate moment, we can think about something concrete, something like a combination. And here it comes. F takes e4, 
a very strong move by Nimzovich. He's sacrificing a knight for two pawns, but his pieces are getting very active. So after rook takes f2, now we see that the bishop is uh, uh, undermined for some time. It will be threatened after a minute like bishop b, b, d3. Maybe white had to find some kind of, uh, mm, to, uh, at least to seek for some kind of opportunity to activate his pieces with bishop f4. But still, after bishop, rook takes b2, bishop e5, rook f8, white cannot really develop any kind of activity. Black is going forward and white is practically losing. So, uh, in order to avoid it, um, white played the move queen to g5 in this position, just protecting the, bi the bishop, and uh, now went to play king h1, so queen g5 will, will get some support to the g3 pawn. However, black continued with the simple rook a to f8, f8 and now we see an idea like rook f8 uh, uh, to f5. So, with this move, white's queen will be in trouble, and... Uh, that's what actually happened. White played king h1, and uh, after that move, black played the simple rook to f5. So, uh, practically, this move uh, leaves white no option but to go with queen, king, queen e3. And now, practically, black had an opportunity to win, to win white's queen immediately. So, he had a chance to play rook e2. The only chance for white's queen to go is on b3, but then bishop a4, rook c8, and rook f8 is capturing black's white's queen. Uh, maybe Nimzovich overlooked this line, uh, but maybe he was uh, um, uh, thinking about something else to do uh, because he knew that his position was completely winning. However, I think from, from an instructive point of view, he made even uh, even stronger move. So he played the, the simple queen to e3. White continued in this position with uh, bishop to e3. White continued with rook c to e1. And black played the simple h6. And what happened in this position is that white simply resigned. This is a very uh, weird decision by white because it seems that he's only two pounds down. And so there is a lot of time for, for black to get this position into a win. However, if we see this position in a deeper way, we will see that white has absolutely no move to, to play and... Uh, keep his position uh, together. For example, if he plays something like g4, there is a move like rook f3. If white takes on f3 with this, uh, with this uh, um, bishop, then there is the simple rook h2 coming with a, with a checkmate. If white tries to go with some move like a3, maybe to open some uh, files there, again there is a threat. Bishop takes a, b takes a3, b takes a3, and rook 5 to f3 is coming. So now the queen will be threatened and eventually, when white takes the rook, black recaptures, and again, white's queen is trapped. So, after king h2, it's true that white is getting two rooks for the queen. However, both of black's bishops are taking any possible a uh, arena for, the, uh, for the white's rooks to go. And now, after e5, rook c1, and maybe the prophylactic king h7 will decide the game. Black's plan will be to bring the queen on f5, then to f3, to kick the bishop on e3, and eventually to go with these connected pawns uh, on d5 and d4, after the exchange on e5. So, this is completely winning position for black, and maybe this is the reason why uh, white resigned. And uh, what I can tell is that that game shows very instructively how important it is to make most of the pieces active and meanwhile to prevent the opponent's plans by exchanging his own active pieces, interrupting his positional ideas and always to take care and put together our plan with the, uh, with the one that our opponent actually has. So, what, uh, what you saw in this, in this instructive example was that uh, uh, little by little, black was, uh, was uh, uh, taking more and more space in, white, in white's position. So, uh, this very interesting moment happened when white had most of his pieces put on, on the back rank, so he was unable to, to not, not only to do any counterplay, but he was unable to stop black's counter, uh, counterplay. I find to be particularly instructive how the famous Aaron Imzovich actually did uh, uh, the, all of this uh, a, a perfectly by first taking the control of the center, next activating his forces on the king side, and to f uh, finally attacking on the opponent's weak places, uh, and this is eventually the um, f2 pawn. So in that game, 
For first, he introduced the importance of amount active pieces coordinated and concentrated in a common cause and target against uh, the opponent's position. Okay, so thank you very much and uh, see you next time.